so it's time so it's time to start with the lesson so first of all i want to recap the schedule so right now this is the first lesson of the second module of the c++ course that won't be great so we are entering entering phase number three of the course so the first one was about installing an operating system easy the second one was even more easy it's the c++ core language now we are going to dive deep into what i am calling more in c++ um, just to give it a name but today we are going to see classes that classes has been in c++ since day zero so it's not extremely modern but the way we will approach uh, these topics i will try to make it as modern as possible so starting from this week on so the homeworks will be a bit more difficult from previous homework in terms of i will give you will be giving you less pointers so they will be more like a high level um, instructions for doing the homework and you will be in charge of designing the api and the implementation of the classes that i will ask you to do uh, so just one comment so uh, this homework like number seven and number eight will be about the final project so this is the same as homework five and homework four so these four homeworks are the most important uh, homeworks in the class because they will be used on your final project okay that being said let's start with the lesson with a really small example that i will try to motivate more or less uh, why we should be using classes and new types in c++ uh, but of course this is just a small introduction so in 10 minutes i will try to convince you that there is a better way of writing this example so let's start so on this application let's pretend that i want to model an image like a rgb image like a picture and for now let's keep it simple and short so it fits on the on the screen and let's pretend that i want to have some functionality over this data one will be like save image so in this case i want to save a given image to the to the file system to the disk for example i would also like to load images from the file system and for some given reason i also want to check if again some image is empty right so by the way we are not going to to implement this functionality so this is a high level example as you already know this is so if you really want to implement this you need to open curly braces here and blah 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 start coding right but for now let's keep it simple and just declare the prototype we um, declare the function but we don't do the, the implementation so how can, how can we start working with these images so first we will uh, define a new vector of bytes so how you can do this is using you unsigned integer of eight so this is basically eight bits uh, that we mold one byte and this will be a vector so each byte will represent one pixel for the given channel we'll have a number of rows and columns uh, by the way we saw one example of this on previous lesson and then we want to populate the image so let's say that we have the lena image on the file system and then we want to load the image and then we need to pass a reference to where we want this data to be filled in the number of rows and columns will be deducted from the files uh, that you're reading so when you call this you basically you will go here and then you will populate uh, this data member and also the rows and the column that's why these are, are non-const reference so these are like input data to this particular function and then we want to check if this image for some reason is empty uh, so we can check like this or, or actually we can also add like or uh, rows are zero and calls are zero for example so if any of these two elements are zero or the image or this function returns empty for some reason 
we can say, okay, there was an error, so I will print the user, and actually here we're gonna return an error code and skip the program. Let's pretend that the image is not empty, so we do something, something here, whatever, filtering, processing, you name it, and then we want to save these results to the disk. So we will pick a new file name, so we don't overwrite the, the previous one, and then we will pass the data to this function, and then the rows of, of, and the columns of, of this um, particular image. Okay, that was an easy example. Uh, explain like this, looks like it's innocent, and actually there's nothing wrong with it. But there are many, many wrong things with this example. So one of the big issues that this example has is that it's a C style C++ code and it's something I am tired of seeing and actually it makes me really mad. So I'm seeing some lags on my feedback. So if you if you don't if you can't see the video properly, just let me know in the comments so we can see how to solve this issue. Okay, I was saying so this is something really common on C++. So you have std vector, so this is something that won't compile on C, so this is a C++ feature. But the rest of the code is written as if you were uh, uh, coding in C. And this is really wrong, because you're not using the language, you're just using the vector, right? This is one of the many reasons why this is wrong. And this is something I will be checking on your homeworks from starting today, and also on your final projects. So. This is not how you will design a C++ code base. Then the second thing that is wrong is that here we have data. So these three members, data, rows, and columns, belong to each other, right? They model an image type on the real world, and they should be packed together. So, but right now they're like three variables that has no interactions with each other, and then you can you cannot like uh, associate these three members, right? So they're three variables, one can be, so if you change one, the other one will not change, and so on. So you're not encapsulating the data, right? So it's spread over your program. That's problem number two. Second problem is that every time you need to do something with the images, you, the programmer, are in charge of passing all the arguments properly. So in this case, we need to pass the, the data we want to populate, the rows and the columns. But maybe I am, for a destruction error, I am doing this, right? And this will compile, will run, and will not give you any error. But there is a conceptual error here. So you're, you're misusing the columns twice. But there is nothing in, the, in this program that prevents you from doing this error. So this is unsafe unless you're a really exper experienced programmer, right? So this is error number three, problem number three. And lastly, something that is really important in C++ is type safety. So this data, this data member here, like this guy, is just a vector, vector of bytes. This can be anything in your program. Right now, you see, no, Nacho, this is the, the data for the image, so it's quite clear. But actually, if you pay attention, this can be anything in your program. Maybe you have a large code base, and you also have vector of bytes with some other data. And then when you, for example, save the image here, you, you can pass another data member that it's not an image, and then what is the expected behavior of this? Maybe it's, I don't know, there's no type safety, nothing in this program will prevent you to pass a data that does not belong to an image, right? So these are like maybe the four weird uh, or most important things that this code has. Uh, like the errors, and we can fix it using modern C++ using uh, classes. So let's go quickly, let's try to rework this. I will try to do it fast, as fast as, as I can. And then we, we will see the benefits. So first of all, we want to encapsulate this data. So we will move this out. And then we want to create a class that is called image, right? For now, let's make this public, we will see more about this, and then let's rename this, just, it's just a naming, right? Now we have a class image that encapsulates three data types, and in this case, 
Whenever you create an image, you will have some data inside and rows and columns, and they are all stick together. So they are all in the same uh, object, right? So now we have encapsulations. The other thing we want to do is how to, let's put this out of screen for now, is how to create this image. So I would like to, for example, create an image type from the file system. How I do this, I will just forget about this explicit word, but image, and then I want to create this from the file system. So I need a, a string that is the file name. And that's it. So I will not write the implementation here. It's just the, the prototype, right? So this is one way I would like to create images, just giving the file name and then trying to, to populate the image. And inside this implementation, that this is a special function that is called constructor, I will populate these three, member, three members. So actually I can reuse the code that I did here. So this goes away. And then also, for example, I would like to create an image, an empty image. And then for this, I will use the default constructor provided by the compiler. In this case, whenever I create the image, it will be completely empty. So these are many ways of creating the images. Then, for example, every time I destroy an image, I would like to save the results to the file list, to the file system. Sorry. Why? Because I don't know. I just want to do it. How I do this is like I will express how I want this particular uh, object to be destroyed with the, with the image destructor. This is another special function. So this is another string. And then let's call it file name. There's a typo here. Good. And then whenever I destroy this image, I will, I will, um, when there is an error, I will save this image to the, ah, that's true. Let's for now let's inside yes. For now let's keep it like this. You cannot pass uh, variables to the constructor. So that's one thing. So and then this will be public to any user. And then lastly, I want to provide um, some functionality to this image. So for example, I want to see if this image is empty and without having to pass the correct data members to any function. So one thing I can do is I can reuse this function, but in this case, boom, I, I don't actually need this uh, member, right? And I can actually mark this as const. We will see this in detail. So whenever I call this is image empty, I will uh, know if the given image is empty without having to do anything else. And then lastly, so I also want to provide a function to save this given image. And the only thing I need right now is uh, this, the file name, because all the other members are uh, inserted inside the, the image class. So now we can actually rewrite our application and it's going to look much better and it's actually more correct. So first we'll create an image, for example, let's call it image. And then we want to use the constructor of this particular uh, new type using the, um, like the one that accepts uh, a file name as input argument. And then we say lena.png. That's it, right? Then we don't need to do this anymore. And then the, if is image empty, we can change this uh like this we can do if image is empty and actually we can change the name of this uh, let's put it empty then you bring an error and then inside this image empty you can do whatever you want to check rows columns the data you name it right and then when we save the image then we don't need to specify anymore where is the data, the rows, and the columns because it, everything is encapsulated uh, within the image. So now the only thing we need to do is image and then save image and then lena new.png. And that's it. That's all. So if you compare this example with the previous example, it's easier to read, it's safer to use, and it's conceptually correct, right? Of course, you will never want to implement your own image class because there are libraries out there. 
but this is just a small example. Okay, with this 10 minutes example, let's try to quickly navigate through what I want you to, to know about C++ classes. So we will not be able to do everything in one hour and I will go as far as I can. And then it's, it's your responsibility to finish the, the slides and to, to study the topics. So you're not going to learn everything about C++ classes in one hour, that's for sure. Otherwise the world will be different and I wouldn't be as crazy as I am. The idea of this is I want to give you the pointers of the most important topics around C++ classes. So if I name bananas, then ideally you will see the one example about bananas in the slides and then you, you will ideally go to CPV reference or the, the C++ book and look around bananas and try to understand more in detail uh, the concepts, right? So this is just like, a, like pointers to keep, give you a quick overview. So classes are used to encapsulate data along with methods to process them. So in our example, we encapsulated the data of the image and the rows and the columns. And the methods were like saving image and asking if, an if a given image is empty. Every class or struct defines a new type. And this is super important because you cannot mix types. So when you call the save image method from the C++ implementation, you cannot uh, save a banana type only images, right? That's the type, type safety system of, of C++. We saw it on previous le lecture. So a type or a class is the name we will be used to using to uh, talk about a defined type. I will probably be using more type than class because I like the idea better than just a class. A variable of such type is an instance of a class or an object. So when I created this, so this guy called image right here, it's basically an instance instance of the class image. So probably the, let's rename this. It's not a good name. And then Lena. Lena is an instance of the class image or just an object. And then classes will allow you to use C++ as an object oriented programming language. So this is not the only paradigm behind C++. It's one of the many paradigms it supports. Uh, so if you want to do OOP, you can do it with C++. And for example, string, vector, all these types on the C++ system are defined as classes, right? So let's see a crash course on anatomy. So this is basically, let's highlight some stuff. So this is where you define the new type with the keyword class or struct is the same. This special function that has the same name as the class will be called constructor and destructors. This is how you create members of this class or how you destroy them. There's also something called member function that are basically all the functions defined within the class. And you can also use uh, define operators. So when you define your own operators, you will give a high level usage to this class. We will see some examples later on. And then whatever is these variables inside the class will be uh, called data members. And this is basically what the data that the class is encapsulating. As a quick reminder, like everything else in C++, whenever you open these curly races, so this guy here and this guy here, you're defining a new namespace. So basically whatever is inside here will be on the namespace of the class. So this A, it's basically my new type, colon, colon, A, right? Just a reminder. Some keywords we will be using. So class definition, uh, it's basically this guy is whatever, it's like the proto, the interface of, of the class without the implementation. So this is uh, analogously to, to function uh, definition and declaration. The class implementation is where you define how you would do all the functions, the constructor and the destructor. So this is where you put the C++ code. The class data member is which data you encapsulate. The member function is how, how you use this data within your class. The constructors are special functions that are used to create members of this class, the destructor to destroy them. 
There's also something called class setters that are all type of functions that will change the, the data members for your given class. Also, we have class getters that are members that will access these uh, member types. For example, if you want to access uh, the data for the images, there's also class operators like how to uh, work with, with different uh, members of the class. And there's also static, static members. So class operators is one of the most uh, fancy uh, features because for example, you, you can have two images and then define the plus operator. And then you can write your own function on how this operator should work. So you can do image C equals to A plus B where A and B are images. And then this plus operator is basically a function. And maybe you want to define this sum to be the sum of all over the pixels with a clamp function, I don't know, it's up to you. And there's also called something called class inheritance that we will see on next lesson. So the syntax is quite easy actually. So the definition will start with the keyword class and then the classes have three access modifiers, private, protected, and public. So wherever it's, it's public, it can be accessed by any other part of the program. Wherever it's private cannot be accessed outside the class. And we will probably see some examples on the homework. By default, everything is private, uh, unless you specify. So if we see this example, here we say public, otherwise this will be um, private. Um, and then when I mean accessing, so if, for example, I do lena.data, then I can, blah, blah, blah. I can do something. So right now I'm outside the class scope accessing a member and this is doable just because this member is public. If I would have like a private member, oops, not you, here, like private and then uh, I don't know, int private. Then if I want to do lena dot uh, private, I actually, I cannot even autocomplete. And you see here an error that you're trying to access uh, private is a private member of image. So you cannot do this like quite easily. So that's basically the idea behind private and public. So you can access any member with the dot operator and the any class ha will have always two special functions. One is called constructor that is called upon creation of the instance and the destructor. This will always have the same name of the class and the destructor will have the, I don't know, the, sorry, this tilde here, the gnocchi, I know how to call this. So that's how you define this is how the structure. And then it's just a recommendation. Google style says use camel case for the class name. This is not uh, strict, so the compiler doesn't care, but if you see a camel case, then it's probably a class. So what about structs? So this is for C programmers. This will be confusing. So the meaning of struct in C++, in C++ has nothing to do with the meaning of the keyword struct on the C language, right? So in C++, a struct is basically a class with all its member public. That's it. It's as easy as it is. And then the idea is that you should be using struct only as a simple data container. So it's like a class that only contains data. Uh, but if you need any type of function, then you, you should be using class instead. So basically, instead, uh, un, un, unless you have like a really easy example, you should be always using structs. The idea is that you should always initialize this type of structs with brace initialization. Uh, so whenever you define, for example, this type of struct, unless you do something weird, the compiler will generate a constructor for you and then you can use this um, brace initialization syntax. What about the data? So the data of the classes can store any type. So you can have vectors, integers, member of another classes. So an image can have, I know, a filter type inside. Uh, ideally, all this data must be private. 
So this is a matter of style. So there is something in object oriented programming that is called data encapsulation. And that's why you should always mark this as private. This is a, how you would use it. So this is, I also do like this. You're not enforced to do it, but all the members I will always do on um, small letters and with the underscore at the end. This way I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the data member and all the data should be set in the constructor. This means whenever I construct this, uh, this an instance of the class, I need to populate all the members, all the data types, the data members inside the constructor and clean up in the destructor. So the classes will always have at least one constructor and exactly one destructor. So you cannot have like multiple destructors. There is always one destructor. So the constructor are basically uh, functions with no explicit return type. And actually this is sort of true. The name will be exactly as the class and there can be as many constructors as you want. If there is no explicit constructor, an implicit default constructor will be generated. So if you don't define your own, the compiler will do it for you. And the same holds true for the uh, constructor. So this is, for example, uh, a, like a dummy example, where you have uh, this sum class, that is the name of the type. And then you have like uh, three different constructors, right? The constructor that, that has no arguments will be always called the default constructor. So if you don't uh, specify any constructor while creating the object, this is the one that you will be calling. And here you have any other two guys, right? And for example, this sum class, so you are not passing any arguments to the constructor, then you will be using this constructor. In this case, you're using one integer. So this is the one that will be you will be using and so on, right? So there are more examples there, you can play with it. So ideally you will be using initializer list to initialize data. So whenever you use vector, you're probably using this. Uh, the name of the getter functions uh, usually will be the same as the private member. So if you want to uh, uh, retrieve data from the class, then you will need to provide a function. So as a small example, Let's pretend for now that this is uh, private. And then now if I want to access the rows, the columns and blah, 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 I cannot access because this is private Then I need to provide getters. So in this case, I can do a vector of, um, and then data. And then this way, whenever, if I want to access the, this data member, I will do lena and then dot data. And this is how you access the vector and so on. So this is called getter. So getter method, right? And then avoid setter. So ideally you will want to set the data in the constructor. So one other type of function you can use is setter methods and then uh, this will be void and set data, for example, and then you provide a qint8 and then other. And then, for example, this is as easy as doing this, right? And then other. And then you're basically copying the data inside the class. But this is like not a good decision. So ideally, you will want to send this data here within, within these two constructors. An example here. So the declaration definition. So data members belong to the declaration. So the class methods can be defined elsewhere. So one thing you can do, for example, is let's forget about these guys. Let's remark this as public. Oops. Not you. Great. So this is the data, the, the class definition and implementation. Let's implement, ooh, where is the is empty? Ah, here. Let's implement this function. How I do this, I will do image and then empty. And then this returns pool. And here is the class, a member class implementation. 
and then I will, for example, return uh, data empty. Just an example, right? Remember, you need to access the namespace image, otherwise you will get an error. This should be marked as const. And that's basically it. Why I can access this data private member? Because inside the image namespace, I can touch my own things, right? The class names becomes part of the function name, and then there is another example here. So some key points about this is C++ allows to initialize variables in place. So this is basically what is uh, mentioning. This is new in C++ 11. Do not initialize this in the constructor. So it's super easy. So if you want to always um, initialize this from zero, do it like this. Otherwise you will need to do it on the constructor. And there is no need for an explicit default constructor if you have like these EC members. So if you actually try this example at your place, you will see that you can construct members of this class without providing the constructor. And then there is a small uh, tip that is leave the members of structs and initialize. Because if you define them, then it will forbid using brace initialization as we saw in the previous example. Then the idea behind the class is also like modular software. So the idea is you would prefer to encapsulate information that belongs together into the class. This is an example, encapsulate data, rows and columns all together inside the class. Uh, and also you want to separate the declaration and definition. So you will have one header file to provide. The, um, so this usually will be on image.hpp and then Sorry. Oops. So oh. image.hpp and then this will be image right? So this is how you will split it. And yeah, so something that is really important about uh, classes is uh, something that we call const correctness. That is, if any member function should not change the data of the class, then it should be marked as const. Uh, oops. So const after a function states that this function does not change the object. So the example here is, you know what? I will turn this, uh, the linter off because it's driving me crazy. Uh, const. And then, um, so, clang D, I love you, but for now let's disable. We need to inspect this code. Yippee, now it's cleaner. Anyway, so I was saying, so this empty function does not change the state of the class. So then it should be marked as const. Uh, this way you, you guarantee that whenever you create, create a const object, you can actually call this function. Mark all functions that should not change the state of the class as const. So unless you need to change like a setter method, the, any member of the class, mark, is, mark the function as const. And this will guarantee you that you can pass objects by const reference and still call these functions. You will probably start with this with the homework. Now it sounds weird. Just uh, you you will struggle most likely. So this is this is a typical const error. So you have a student class, and then you have one data member that is called name, and then for example, ah, there is a typo here. You will have this uh, getter method, and then you want to access this uh, function, right? The thing is, there is this weird error that is always Cons to them, blah, 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 as argument discards qualifiers. What is the problem with this? Is that this print function is taking a const reference to the student. And then the problem is that you, you as the compiler need to make sure that no one changed this student member, right? And then when you call name, there is no cons here. 
So this cons here is part of the type. So this is a, 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 re a cons reference to a string. So this is not uh, part of the cons correctness, but here you're missing this. And even when you're not changing this name uh, data member, the compiler cannot guarantee you that you will not change it. So it will stop the compilation and say, this name function is dangerous. It might be changing something that you declare cons because here you say, this is a cons reference to a student. So this is really a really typical error when using uh, classes. Okay, so we are going to quickly uh, discuss a topic that is called move semantics. So this was introduced on C++ 11 and was one of the big missing parts of the language. And this, you can say that this changed the story on the C++ uh, world. Uh, I'm watching the time right now. And I think, so we will most likely miss half of the slides because I'm going too slow, but I will drop after one hour and I will ask you to complete the slides on your place. So to talk about move semantics, we need to have an intuition on L values and R values. This is actually really easy. It sounds more complicated than it is. Basically L value is left value and R value is right value. So it's quite easy. There are some examples here. So A is an L value because it's on the left side of the, of the wall. And this is usually split here. So whatever is on this side is considered left value and whatever is on this side is considered R value, right? So this, uh, this is L value, L value, L value, L value. This is going to be R value, R values, R values. So whatever is to the right, is going to be an R value. So L values can be written on the left uh, of the assignment operators and R values are all over the expression. If you want to explicitly uh, use an R value, then you will use the, use the double ampersand. And this looks weird, but it's part of the syntax. So it's part of the rules of the language. And there is one utility function on the utility standard library that is move that we will explicitly convert any L value to an R value. For example, in this case, A, so oops, uh, this A here is a left value, but for some reason we want to convert it to an R value, then we will use this utility and then we will call this function over A and then we will get an R value definition. So std move is used to indicate that an object T might be moved from. This actually means that allowing efficiency on transferring resources from one other one object to another. In particular, it will produce an X, X value expression that identifies its arguments T. It's exactly, exactly equivalent to a static cast on an R value reference type. So this is a definition it's impossible to understand. So there are some examples here. So this move is part of the standard library utility, standard utility library. Uh, the idea behind moves is that I will give you a left value and you will give me an R value to this reference. And then this is something really important. The move function does not move anything. So don't think this as taking like you have two objects and then when you move it, you actually move it from one place to another. What is talking, what is the idea behind the move is taking ownership. So we have two objects, A and B, and then for example, B wants to take ownership of A, then you will use the move function, but the object still uh, remains the same. So there is no moving uh, uh, involved. There's one example here. Let's quickly go through it. And then, so we have one print function that takes as input argument or error value and the same function. And then we, this we saw on the overloading examples on the function lecture that you can use the same name of the function with different arguments. And here 
you use the double ampersand to say, okay, this is an error value. And then if you try this example, you, I mean, you will actually do it. It's, I mean, you will play around and it will help you to, uh, to understand the concept. The big advice here is do not access hello after you move, because in this case, so hello is a, it's on the left side of the equal operator. So it's a left value. And then when we call the move function, we are converting this into an R value. So this print function will take ownership of this uh, string. So you're like losing, you say, okay, this is my child, just I left it, it's it's already old enough, you just release ownership. So now the print function can actually own this string and then it's undefined behavior, what will happen after uh, you call this function. There is an example here, make sure you try that at home. And also there is another example here that I will skip. And actually there is a link here, you can click and see the performance. So if you compare like uh, a copy uh, from a move operator, you will see that it's actually faster. And then to summarize, and this is like five minutes about move semantics, it's not enough. So we, will should, we should have one lecture on move semantics. So this means one hour. So remember, these are just pointers to point you where you should be looking information. Whenever we, we talk about a uh, move, you should think about ownership. So an entity owns a variable if it deletes it. If it deletes, a function scope owns a variable defining it. And then moving a variable transfers ownership. So whenever you call move on a variable, you're transferring ownership to uh, uh, this uh, new member. When designing your prime, you should think who should own this thing and then you will know if you should be using move or not. Uh, if we benchmark this, uh, the runtime is better than copy, but it's worse than passes, passing by reference. And now we, we want we reach this point that I don't want to skip, that is operator operator overloading. Is any question popping up so far? Okay, so operators in C++ are basically functions. So you can actually do overloading on these operators. And this is really handy for classes. So this is a signature of any operator. So you will have the keyword operator and then the name is basically the symbol. So for example, the plus symbol, you can take input parameters as any other function and then you have a return type. So you can define the less operator, the greater operator, the equal operator, the assignment operator, and many more. So a list of operators are on this link, and this is one example. So we have a class, a class human, and then this is actually a dummy example, but it's worth it. So this is the class human, and then for some reason, we want to define like when a human is uh, less than other human. And how we, we do this is define the operator less. Then this operator will take as input argument another human, and then this is also marked as const because it should not change the, the objects behind, within this class. And then you will see, okay, if the kindness of the, the object you're talking is less than the other kindness, then I am, I am less than this other guy. So that's basically the idea. You can call this like you can, this is a Boolean operation. So you will have two humans and then you say, if human A is less than B, then you do something. Other option will be sorting. So if you want to call the std sort function, then you need to have defined this operator. And then that's all you need to, to do to reuse the stl uh, sort function. That, so this is one really good advantage of having these uh, templated functions uh, and generics. So you need to write your own sort implementation for classes. The only thing you need to know is to say, okay, if you want to compare if this is less than the other one, that's the only operator you need to know. You can run this example and you will see that it works. Another really cool example is using the left shift, shift bit operator. So in this case, this is the operator overloaded for all streams. And then you probably want to use, okay, C out and then just call human. So this is a, an, an instantiation of the class human. 
and then instead of like writing your own like okay human dot whatever you can just overload the operator uh, for all strings and then you will basically print this message this human is the kind whatever and then you for example call the kindness that will give you the, the value of this uh, data member again it's better if you try it in your place to understand uh, the function so this is actually really important because it's really handy to define the plus operation for point clouds let's say so you have two point clouds and then you want to add these clouds so you have like on really behind the scenes you will have a, a list of xyz points and another list and you just want to add all those points together so you will want a new vector with both uh, members from both sides so you can write a plus operator overload your in your point cloud class and this is going to make your code more readable if you do this in c what you will need to do is to create a add point cloud function and that takes as input arguments two point clouds and returns a third point cloud so that's basically the idea behind all these operators so it's to make much better code so there are some class special functions and this is something that people struggle a lot with because there are rules that no one wants to learn but let's go quickly through it one of these special functions is the copy constructor so this is called automatically when the object is copied for a given class the signature of this copy constructor is like this and there's here an example of user so when you create a new instance of my class and then you use the the parentheses operator then you're basically calling this copy constructor so maybe you want to define uh, your own implementation on how you should copy data so in this case it's hidden from the in the slides there's a copy assignment operator that is equivalent to the constructor that is called automatically when the object is assigned to a new value from a left value and the signature is this one so you overload the operator equal and there is here an example of usage so in this particular case you're calling the copy cons not the code no you're calling the copy assignment operator so this is another typo on the slide um, so if for some reason you want to overload the copy assignment operator you might have some uh, uh, reason of why you should do this you will see some example on next lecture there is also some something called move constructor so this is special special function number three this will be called automatically when the object is moved so the prototype is like this and this is the interface as well again this the for one there is something called move assignment operator this is the interface is as similar as the it's super similar to the copy assignment operator the only difference is that it takes an error value as reference and there is one example here and there are this all those four um, um operators uh, define it uh, here so this is an example that you should try uh try to type it by your own and then you will see like when you're calling each one uh but basically if you for example focus on the usage so let's take this out so if you focus on how you would use this particular class it's basically using any other type so you create a member then you assign it but behind the scenes there's a lot of stuff going on and then this is something that you should start paying attention when writing C++ program. So in C, this is usually trivial because you're basically assigning uh, built-in types. But in your case, you will be defining your own types. And all these single operations, like an innocent equal, can be a whole function implementation. So just keep in mind that there is something always behind the scenes in C++. And then, so wow, many functions, much scary. Do I need to define all of them? So the constructor and operators will be generated automatically. All so constructors, the default constructor, the default structure, and these four 
special functions makes six functions so it's a lot of code to write but this will be generated automatically by the compiler under some conditions so this is the rule of all of anything so if none of them are defined the compiler will do it for you so this is for example what you should be using for homework number four so don't define any of these six special functions but if you for some reason define any of these six special functions then none are auto generated so let's pretend that for some reason you say okay i will define the destructor okay then all these five other functions are not defined by the compiler anymore but if you don't define any of them the compiler will do it for you so the idea is that's the rule of all or nothing so try to define none of the special functions because usually uh, the compiler will give you a better implementation unless you really uh, need to do it if you must define one of them then you need to define all of them and then for if you want to for example just define the destructor and then you don't need to you don't want to write the implementation for the other five uh, special functions then you just call this equal default and then this will tell the compiler okay compiler just use the one you you were expecting to use i trust you so this is how you should use it and then lastly you can also the let functions we will see how to use this when we uh, study the singleton pattern next lesson that will be also used on your homework number seven but basically any function can be marked as deleted and then when you try to call this function then the compiler will say okay this function for some given reason is not implemented and it's deleted so you you're not allowed to call this function and then there's this singleton pattern example and we will see like i will copy the slides when we see the singleton pattern and then almost lastly we will see static variable methods so let me check one thing we're going with time so this is something that is usually confusing for a lot of people again i feel like this is a lot of information for one hour but ideally this you will be the the glossary for searching other times uh, or to googling stuff or watching tutorials on cpp reference so uh, yeah okay so remember that whenever you you see or think as the word static in c++ this means something that is somehow related to comp compile time processes so if it's marked as static is something that should happen at compile time right and wherever it's dynamic is something that will happen at runtime so you can have a static variable uh, on your class so this means uh, something that will happen so will be created at compile time and not at runtime and will be uh, only one for class so we saw an example of static variables on lecture three i guess but in this is basically the same the value will be the same across all instances and actually before C++11 you need to give this value on the cpp function uh, file but now on C++17 you can create a header file and say static variable and give the value there then you also have static member functions this is something that might be useful when you're designing your own types do not need to access through an object of the class so because this is a static then it's created this function will be created at compile time so you don't actually need to create an object of this particular type to call this function that's the idea and can also access private members but need an object so the syntax is you use the class name namespace and then you use double colon and then you call the, the static method example here is static variables so on this case we have this integer variable that is static so we want to keep like how how many objects are created so whenever and here we're defining a, a custom constructor and a destructor and whenever we we create an object or destruct we will increment or decrement this uh, function so you can use it 
like without doing anything more just make sure you um you try this example so this particular thing here uh, so this is no it's this is basically giving a value at compile time to this static variable. This is not needed in C17. So on C17, you will put here on the declaration, you will put here equals to zero, right? And then you have count objects, and every time you create an object or you destroy it, then you will see how many times it will be this count increment. So try it at your place. This is, for example, uh, another um, example on static members member functions so for example this distance function so let's say you have a class point and then you want to compute the distance between two points so it's actually weird let me see yeah it's actually weird if you call this function because you are saying if you are calling a dist member function you're actually computing the distance between P1 and P2, but the syntax is weird. Then it's not really clear what's going on. So you will actually want to call a distance function on points. So that's why now it belongs to the class and it's not like a floating function somewhere else. And then you pass as arguments two points. This distance function that is marked as static does not need to instantiate an object of the class. So you can call this without creating any object. And then it will take two points as reference and then it will compute the distance and then return a floating point value. So if you find yourself on this kind of situation, so static member functions are ideal uh, for this case. And lastly, there's uh, this using keyword uh, that is replacing the type def from C. So ideally, uh, you should not be using type defs for some reasons, uh, but with this you can create type alias. So we saw some examples on the homeworks, but basically the syntax is using and then you type and then you you create the, the you mark the old type. For example, using vector float equals to std vector angular brackets float. Right. So this using word is quite versatile. So you can use it for names, spaces, for types. And when used outside of functions, declare a new type alias. And when you use inside the function, we'll create a type alias, but within the scope of the function. So this is something that you should start using uh, from now on to uh, make your code more readable. So this is basically has no impact on the, um, sorry, on the runtime and actually improves the, the code readability. So in this case, we have an image that takes as, input, as template input arguments to two types. And for example, I want to use an, an image float that will be this class image with the type float and then with a given size, right? And this is some type aliasing. There are some examples here. The idea is that you should be using this to uh, reduce verbosity of your classes in C++. And then lastly, super quickly, enumeration classes are a new feature in C++. Uh, enum types are from C, but not classes. So this is what, what is also called scope enums. You can have an enumerated type, uh, but scope within a, a class namespace. So the example here is like, so you have this enum class channel, and then you have std out and std error. There are many reasons why this is better than just using plain enums. For now, just take this as granted, use enumeration, uh, scope enumeration instead of plain enumeration. And then whenever you want to, for example, you want to switch, and then according to the channel, you print, for example, a message to the C out, the, uh, the, C, the standard error or whatever, and then you can do case and then channel std out that is the first enumerate enumeration and then std error and then the difference here is this little guy so you have this enumerated type is names is under the namespace of the class channel so std out and std error is basically zero one in this example so this can be anything so you can ideally put case one here but when using scope enumerations, then the compiler will guarantee you that you actually don't access uh, 
don't use the, like these mixed numbers. So it has a, a, a more high level understanding of the enumeration. You can also add explicit values. Okay, one hour. So that was a lot of information. Most likely the summary is that we saw the basic anatomy of C++ classes, how to work with cons correctness and move semantics. Again, it's impossible that you actually learn this in one hour. Uh, so this is basically a pointer. So after this lecture, so you probably don't even need to rewatch the lecture, but you should know what you should be looking for. If you just type in Google C++, C++ classes, there will be a lot of information. So ideally, I am trying to give you like what is most important about all this information. So if you want to dive deep, on classes then go to cpp reference there's a lot of examples and they're actually self-contained and it's actually really easy to understand from those examples also make sure you remember there is something called operator overloading so don't write add image functions you can use the plus operator and define the the function there and there, there, then also remember the class special functions. So there, there are six constructor, destructor, copy assignment operator, move assignment operator, copy constructor, and move constructor. If you define one of these six guys, then you need to define all of them. You can use the default flag to the compiler to tell, okay, this you will define yourself. And if you find yourself relying on methods that should not be called from objects itself, you can add static variables and methods to your classes, right? videos for this uh, week there is a 10 minutes introduction to, to c++ classes so i actually like this channel on c++ the only thing i don't like is that this guy uses um, the microsoft visual studio ide and then half of the things he do is like black magic that no one understands besides microsoft but the concepts are explained clearly and there are like 10 minutes videos so not one hour so you can actually go and check it out then there is a small interaction in unit testing. So this is something that was planned for this week. So you should look at least this 10 minutes interaction. And if I have time between this week and the following, I will be giving you a tutorial on unit testing. That is something that I will ask you to do uh, starting from next, so from homework seven, uh, eight, nine, and then the final project. So it's something you should learn how to use. Uh, it's not super complicated. And then there are a lot of references that I've used across the, these slides. So there are two slides with references. So make sure you click on all of these links and at least read the introduction. Thank you for your attention.